All right, the host has started this webinar. Excellent. And we got people already joining in. I absolutely love that. <laughs> so while we have, you know, while people are rolling in this kind of stuff, I guess it would be kind of fun just to talk about, like, in the last week or so, what kind of productions have you, uh, have you been doing in terms of, like, you know, what sports, like, what is the scale of the production, this kind of stuff? Yeah, we're well into uh, basketball season, so we got men's and women's basketball. Uh, we're mostly doing linears right now, so... Uh, SEC Network, ESPN2, I guess, maybe you. We did uh, women, no, men's basketball on Saturday, which was kind of cool. We actually had uh, Joe Lenardi. Yeah. Uh, we had him in as a, sort of an interview in game, but he was uh, live from home. So we were able oh, cool. to bring him in over Zoom, which is pretty cool. Yeah. And for the people, myself, who may not be entirely on point with Texas A&M, who is that guy? Uh, yeah, Johnny. Who is that guy? Uh, so uh, Joe and Artie, just the guy. The, he's like a, the college basketball guy. He always makes the picks for the um, the tournament, the NCAA tournament. He makes the picks, and you know he's their insider of whatever it's like he the says. Bracketology goes. guy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Got we're uh, he had us on the outside looking in right now, but. Uh, Working our way up there. So um, for everybody just now showing up, thank you uh, for uh, joining Texas A&M and TAG on today's webinar. Uh, we're going to wait till about 8.02 or 10.02 or 11.02 or whatever time zone you happen to be on uh, to start. And uh, we're just kind of catching up on anything good uh, that's been going on with us. Um, we'll reiterate this a few times during the webinar. We want this to be as... Uh, open as possible. Uh, so if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we've got some back channel communications going on here. So if there's any questions that come up, um, put them in the chat. We'll make sure we get them all because that's the whole point of this is we have some of the industry's leading experts in IP infrastructure with Zach Bacon and Johnny Kerr here. And we want to make sure that whatever questions you have, those gentlemen uh, can answer. Because again, that's why we're here, you know, and it doesn't necessarily have to be about tag. This isn't just about, you know, this, the, our, our product. It uh, is more of a conversation about the technology, the technology choices, how it's implemented and things like that as a whole. Uh, so as you go through this, if you have any questions, again, feel free to put it in the chat and uh, go from there. So since we're um, about to the 802 time sorry guys i'm on west coast so you know you're going to see a bit of a bias um we can go ahead and start with simple introductions so uh texas a&m gentlemen uh, feel free to start off and introduce yourself and uh tell us something that you may think is relevant to this conversation well i am zach bacon i'm the chief engineer here at texas a&m uh we work in 12th man productions which is the broadcast and post-production group for texas a&m athletics uh, so we handle you know all of the espn broadcasts for texas a&m as well as uh all the post-production content you know we got about 17 full-time staff here and then we are uh largely supplemented by uh, uh student workers so about 100 student workers and we do everything i mean from big screen shows the in venue video boards to national broadcasts to uh, weekly episodic stuff for football and post-production social media content and all that so and uh, i'm johnny kerr i'm the broadcast engineer here um i do a lot more of the uh day-to-day -day stuff I say while Zach handles a lot of the um, big picture infrastructure. Um, I'm doing a lot of the uh, broadcasts and, you know, setting up everything, making sure our control rooms are running and uh, managing our student engineers and uh, make sure everything works so we can go live. And that's something I want to touch on in a little bit um, is about the student engineers and this kind of stuff, because I think that's kind of a next factor for you. So I, I think that's actually a really interesting part. Uh, especially with getting people trained in the industry and how that's been affected with 2110. But before we dive into that part, just an introduction with myself. Uh, I am Robert Erickson. I am uh, Vice President of Life Production and Sports for uh, Tag VS. And um, our whole goal here is just to let everybody 
hear about Texas A&M. Now, granted, we'll talk about TAG a little bit because, well, it's, you know, why we're doing this. But we really want to hear about your entire workflow. How does, you know, your entire facility work? What do you do? What do you support? How do you support it? Um, and even the, the stuff on the students. We want to talk about that a little bit. But just starting off on the top, how about you tell us about your facility? You know, you've, you've, what kind of productions do you do? What is the scale of productions you do? I mean, how many do you do a year? Things like that. Um, and then, um, you know, you did this big migration over the past 12, 24 months and uh, between, from SDI into a 2110. Uh, so we just kind of want to cover that. So we'll take it up into little pieces and whichever one you want to start with, we'd love to hear. Sure. Yeah, I mean, so our facility was actually um, constructed in 2014 as part of a, a bigger project with the football stadium. And uh, that was before either of us were here. Um, but the decision was... Uh, smartly made to make it a centralized uh, production facility. And so all of our venues connect back uh, to the football stadium via dedicated fiber. And so we have four, well, kind of three and a half control rooms, three full-size control rooms, and then a fourth smaller one. And that essentially allows us to do two sports at a time because as part of the, um, you know, part of it is we do the in-stadium show for the big screen and uh you know or the jumbotron or whatever you want to call it um and then the other half is the espn broadcast since we are part of the sec uh, we have obligations to produce uh x number of games at uh you know various levels for the sec network um and so we do about a hundred or so events a year uh so it's wow. it's it, there's a lot of, <laughs> yeah, we always have something going on. I mean, we support every, well, almost every sport, um, you know, pretty much any, any sport you see on ESPN, it's uh, soccer, volleyball, basketball, baseball, softball, football. Um, so it's, uh, it's been a journey from, from the ESPN side with all the schools and, uh, and growing the, the whole idea of schools doing the production. So um, we're doing more and more of those national level broadcasts, which is pretty cool. So, yeah, along those lines, let's talk about some of the tech, the, your differences in requirements or in, in differences in technical things to be able to produce maybe like a board show for a football game down to covering lacrosse or water polo. I don't even know if you guys cover water polo, but I'm trying to think of a, a smaller scale production you may be doing. Um, you know, I've been at your facility when you're doing the board show and you've got two, sometimes three control rooms spun up, some to support ESPN, some to support SEC, some to support your board shows, so things like that. So you have those bigger productions and then you go down to your the smaller ones for just in-house uh, type productions or something for a smaller SEC. So how does how do you scale those productions? How do you scale those operations in terms of personnel and uh, and so forth, going from the giant shows to the much smaller shows? Well, it's, yeah, there's a... Uh... There's the engineering side, and then there's the uh, you know actual production side of the the people who are producing the game. And a lot of times for us, the engineering side stays the same. I mean, um, you know, we we talk about some of the when we lower some of the levels of broadcast, the engineering doesn't really change. But um, it just it depends on the needs and the requirements from ESPN as well as our needs and requirements for our video board shows. I mean, football for us is, you know, that's, that's kind of the, uh, the money maker. And so we pour a lot of our effort into those video board shows. I mean, we're running nine manned cameras just for our video board show for, uh, for football. And so that's kind of some of our bigger productions out of the entire year. Um, you know, and it, it changes and just depends on again what the requirements are versus what we have available if we're doing multiple shows at the same time uh we can scale up scale down like you said so you talked about the multiple requirements which is actually quite a good segue to this you know you've moved from an sdi facility to an ip facility you know simply 2110 and so forth um of you know, the, your decisions to make the move to IP, what, you know, what was in your head on that? Like, why make the jump? Why, why make the effort? Why, why do the expense? You know, was, what were your operational requirements that would like to, uh, that kind of wanted you to get into the IP domain in the first place? Yeah, the, 
process for us actually started back in 2018. Um, that's when we first kind of evaluated and, and, and thought about how a transition for us would even look. Um, and that was uh, myself and previous engineer, uh, Jesse Janoski, who's now over at uh, Cardinals Insignia. And they're the ones who actually brought us to the tag booth um, at NAB. So, um, you know, you can thank him, I guess. But, uh, you know, it was... Um, it was the evaluation of how we were transporting uh, signals between venues. You know, at the time, it was a bunch of CWDM, and that was kind of limiting. And uh, we were lugging around these big fly packs. Uh, Johnny knows. Me particularly as a student. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this was back when uh, Johnny was a student, and, uh, you know, those were fun yeah. things to uh, lug around. Mm -hmm just, you know, these kits that probably stood from the floor to, you know, about chest level. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was as nice and convenient as it was to be able to use those, it was still limiting in the capacity. Um, I think it was like we were able to, we sent like eight, it was like eight by four, or eight by yeah. six or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, especially for our uh, arena where we do basketball and volleyball and basketball being some of our um, more resource intensive shows uh, that just was starting to not cut it in terms of the capacity between control room and facility. And so, you know, we started looking at, okay, what are the options to sort of increase that density while also not trying to increase our fiber usage because that's also a limited resource. And so, you know, we kind of came up with this idea of working from the outside in, and that's kind of a terminology we started using, like working from the outside in of transport between venues and then working towards uh, uh, transitioning our core infrastructure. And so over the past few years, as it made sense and as um, system replacement came up, uh, you know, we would always think, all right, can this be 2110 and does it make sense? And then let's evaluate and find the right component for us for that system that, um, that, that we choose. So let's, uh, let's dive in on that a little bit, by the way, um, on this outside in portion. Um, so you started with some sort of technology at the edge, you know, out in the stadiums um, that was able to multiplex um, more signals down to a single amount of fiber. Like, how did that start? You know, so, so basically it sounds like you just kind of started, you know, a step one. I just want to get transport layer in there. I just want to be able to give video from point A to point B in a better way they're doing it now. And then it kind of built out. So can you talk about like the decision process on that? And, uh, you know, talk about how you how you did start going from the outside and, and, and brought that in more and more and more till where you're at today, where you have your entire facility now is running as, a, as an IP plant. Yeah, I mean, so the we knew that 2110 was, you know, obviously where everything was going and we knew we wanted to start working on that. And the cool thing was that with our infrastructure and the way we were uh, set up, it allowed us to slow roll kind of our transition, which gave us the opportunity to both get experience and try things as it made sense and not have to take this huge project on and learn everything all at once. You know, it was, all right, we're going to try this and we want to increase our density. We want to decrease our fiber count if possible, or at least not increase it. And uh, we want something that can sort of be flexible for the future. And so, you know, we started evaluating what some of the gateway options were out there. And we ended up going with, uh, imagine the Selenium network processors, um, you know, not uh, the cool thing with that is like, once we're done with it as a gateway, it becomes a network processor. And so we can use it for up, down, cross, or, you know, mm -hmm. all sorts of different things. And, and that's when we started to, some of the things started to click about 2110 and what it can be uh, as you design your, you know, facility. Like you can think through the systems that can grow and change with you without becoming obsolete. And so, 
you know, that was some of the evaluation process. Yeah, and the immediate benefit that we had from um, the venue side was, you know, we went from eight by four of our video transport to and from the venue to 16 by 16 over oh. less fiber. Um, and so that was a, you know, a huge, a huge benefit from that that we saw right away. And less gear you're having to lug around you oh, know, yeah. as a, yeah. a, a <laughs> one RU uh, unit was a lot friendlier for me. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. We and no so, longer, I mean, all of our venues are now always online as we, you know, instead of, all right, it's this season. So we got to move mm -hmm. stuff around. Yeah. We used to move everything around the venue based on whatever season it is. Now we have that transport readily available uh, all the time for those venues. So that seems to kind of drive up kind of a focus of like your ability to kind of keep up with the pace of change, like as your requirements in Texas A&M and ESPN and SEC ask you to do more things, just that first simple step seems to allow you to kind of be able to adapt to that pace of change to be able to, to, to work with it. And it almost kind of simplifies the workflow. Would that be a too succinct of a summary or is, is that accurate? I'd say that's accurate. I mean, the one of the cool things I think that we do from a operational standpoint or you know from the business side is that you know we have a rolling sort of five-year plan that we work through with our cfo um, to upgrade components as we go you know different aspects of our overall infrastructure um, so it allows him to plan for those expenses without having to write that big check every 10 years um, but the the real benefit and the real cool thing that that does, it allows us to, like you said, be nimble. We can um, start, you know, we can evaluate things as we go and change directions and stay up with, you know, what we think is relevant and where we're going to go. And it just allows us to be a lot more adaptable. And rather so, than having, you know, one big change, um, we're able to learn kind of as we are growing in this. So, you know, we learned um, a lot from the first iterations at the at the venues with the S and P's, and so then once we have everything installed um, completely here, that we already knew how it all works and how it all ran, and so it wasn't a big shock. So that's something I think we can't understate enough on the twenty one ten world is if you're coming out of SDI, the learning curve isn't really a curve going into twenty one ten. It's kind of more of a wall you have to literally plan out and assault to be able to kind of get that get that knowledge base there. So that outside in thing seems to give you that ability where you started kind of on the smaller side of twenty one ten in terms of knowledge base of how does the flow work, how does the multicast work, how do we get it from point A to point B and then kind of built up the facility and your knowledge base as you as you went. And to that point, what else, you know, now that you've gone from the the outside of the SMPs and worked your way into the facility, can you describe kind of the key points, the key infrastructure that you're using for the rest of it? You know, what are you doing for orchestration? What are you doing for switch fabrics and all the edge points around it and so forth? Yeah, so Cisco is our uh, is our preferred and chosen vendor for, for network. Um, you know, I've had, I have network experience prior to this, but it was certainly not enough to uh, to fully grasp everything. So luckily, like you said, it's we've been able to learn as we go. And so it's it wasn't as big of a wall for me, but there was still, you know, it's pretty good incline in terms of that learning curve. Um, but Cisco for our uh, our uh, network fabric, um, we decided and chose uh, EVS Cerebrum for. Uh, for our control and routing system. Um, and from that, everything ties in. And so imagine, like we said, for the gateways, we are Dreamcatcher for replay, expression for graphics, grass for cameras and switchers, uh, Lavo for audio. What am I missing? I think that's it. RTS for, yeah. for comms. Tom. So, you know, it's, it's, we are a uh, live interop here. Um, you know, we, we, like I said, we evaluate as it comes up, what's the best solution for us. And, uh, and we try to pick what makes the most sense and what's going to also integrate the best, you know, um, instead of choosing one vendor to do everything, it's just, it's, uh, it, we get more bang for the buck that way for us. 
so I love that part about how you, you know, you evaluated all the basic technologies and you chose what's best. You know, some people kind of go for this. I just want to do one vendor because I know it's going to work thing. But sometimes you just don't get the best solution. And for you, it definitely seems like you evaluated every single vendor to be the best in their domain and chose based on them, um, which I think is actually really quite exceptional. Um, how does it work with all those vendors? You know, I you say you have like a Grass Valley switcher that's going to have to tally onto a tag multiviewer, and then you got Cerebrum in the middle. You know, how how did your interop process work? Did you kind of do a small POC for everything? Did you test it? Did you rely heavy on the vendors? I mean, describe that process of getting all those different vendors working together into one solution. I mean, some people might call us idiots with some of the work that we take on ourselves and uh, some of the extra effort we choose to put in. Um, you know, we do everything in house. Uh, we use diversified uh, systems to do some of the work like we brought them in this summer to rip out our uh, baseband router and redo our patch band for us. I mean, they've got that that sort of experience to sort of be able to do it three times, four times faster than us. So, but outside of that, you know, we like to dig in and understand at a deep level what we're using. And so um, it's just by that process, you know, we have been able to figure out um, how to make it all work together. I mean, a big component of it is Cerebrum and the inherent abilities of it. I mean, I don't know what their protocol count lists is in terms of the what they support, but it's over 100, I think. And uh, so everything for us ties back into that. And, you know, a big piece for us is Inmos. Um, we're, we're heavily relying on Inmos. And so when something doesn't support Inmos, uh, there has to be a big justification for why we would end up using something that doesn't. I mean, and you know, there's uh, we mentioned Lavo Audio. They don't they don't support Inmos at the moment, but uh, you know, the, uh, there was a lot of other factors that went into choosing that one, and we were able to work around some of those limitations. And Cerebrum helped us do that as well. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's a lot of heavy lifting on us, but then having good relationships with, you know, vendors and uh, being able to work through bugs and stuff as they pop up. I mean, Johnny's been doing a lot of that with, uh, with some Cerebrum stuff with tag API, um, you know, so he can speak a little bit more to that problem. Yeah. And I mean, for us, I think the uh, mindset really is if you don't do that heavy lifting yourself and, um, you know, you're more hands off and just say, you know, like set this up for me and I'll use it. Then how do you, uh, you know, troubleshoot that when things go wrong? You know, if we're, mm -hmm. if we are heavily involved in the process, it may be more work. And, but, um, you know, when we are there setting everything up ourselves and, and things go wrong, we know exactly, you know, where that problem lies or we know how to find it, um, because we set it all up. Um, but yeah, and we have been, um, using Cerebrum, uh, for everything and, and the implementation with the, the API, I mean, with tag specifically and just the customization that we have and um, can make everything work for our system. It's just been great. Yeah. So on that customization part, since it's uh, topical, you know, what unique things that you kind of bring into that in, in terms of customizing your system, you know, obviously there's some customization of the multi-viewer. Um, but obviously there's gotta be some benefits for you to be kind of do, to be doing this custom level stuff, which kind of gets you to, um, you know, why you're doing IP in the first place. So can you go into some of the details on that? You know, what have you customized, why it was important to you and, um, so forth. I mean, for us, it's all about like flexibility, scalability, you know, some of these buzzwords, but they're for us real. I mean, it's like, like we said, the number of games that we do, the number of different sports that we support, having to do, you know, volleyball one day, soccer the next day, football in the weekend, um, and, you know, sometimes two different sports at the same time. We needed something, and we always need our solutions to be able to fit our needs. And so, um, you know, things with the integration between Cerebrum and TAG, you know, for instance, we use Dactronics uh, video boards and we're able to get our clock and score data 
as a UMD in TAG through Cerebrum. Mm -hmm. So it's this kind of very intricate uh, signal path, but that's pretty unique for us. I mean, and that's something we, we never had before. And uh, that's some of the power that we've been able to leverage of just having everything network based, you know, it eliminates a lot of that serial sort of workflow and you already have this network infrastructure in place. So you're just leveraging and getting better density, more bang for the buck, you know, reusing the same infrastructure. Yeah. And everything is, you know, talking to each other. And so if Cerebrum can see that, then I can use that to make a display on the monitor um, to, um, and we also have, you know, we have the four different control rooms and like Zach said, we're doing multiple events at different times. And so, you know, everything can't have the same tally all the time. So I'm, you know, going through and setting up, okay, this control room is going to be getting this tally and this control room is going to be getting this tally. And so, um, you know, everything is tallied differently. Um, and it's all comes back to, to one, one central place. So when you're kind of going through this IP transition and, um, so forth, was there anything that you're like, you know what, this is a huge feature I didn't expect or, Whoa, Hey, this is something that was like bad news bears. We need to make sure we re-engineer around this, you know, was, you know, if, if there's there one or two things, if you're talking to a larger audience, you say this one, great, this one, bad, just something to kind of, kind of share that knowledge with, uh, with the larger, larger group. You know, some of the benefits that you talk about, but it's different until you see it is the amount of gear you don't have to have anymore, you know, DAs and all of this cabling. I mean, we pulled out five pallets of, of baseband, wow. you know, SDI this summer. And, uh, it, just seeing that in the number of like, rack space, the amount of rack space that we gained back and just all of these ancillary benefits that is inherent as part of the network, you know, between distribution and all of the, uh, all of the things that you would need some of these, this other gear to be able to get your signals everywhere they need to go. Um, that was pretty cool to see in real, you know, uh, in real life, as opposed to just a academic exercise of, oh yeah, you know, you don't have to buy a DA and you don't have to do all these other things. So that was a pretty cool, uh, a pretty cool benefit. Um, some other things that didn't go well, um, I would say, <laughs> make sure you have enough time. So we were, we were a <laughs> victim of our own sports team's success. Our baseball team, uh, went into super regionals, which we were hosting. And so we had to help produce. And so that took us into the middle of June, whereas normally, you know, we expect June and July to be completely open. And so that pushed our entire transition timeline this summer back. And, uh, we were probably three weeks behind where we wanted to be. And yet, Jeez. uh, football still came around at the same time. They didn't adjust the schedule. So, <laughs> Uh, we had some growing pains as we were still getting everything up and running for the first couple of weeks, I'd say. Um, so plan yeah, out we, and make sure you have time. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, we had a really good plan in place. And then, <laughs> uh, you know, our, our baseball team kept winning and kept winning. And so, you know, we couldn't be yeah, upset oh my, at all, really. struggle yeah. on that. Uh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. But, we're doing too good. You know, so now, so now we're in the College World Series. I planned my wedding for that time, too. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I wasn't even there. <laughs> Uh, and so, and then, uh, you know, the transition came around and, and, you know, we had some, we had some late nights, uh, um, getting ready for the, uh, football season, um, with our new system, but it all worked out in the end. Yeah. I so, think we saw each other a lot more than, yeah. uh, we saw anybody else for the last two weeks of the, of the summer. <laughs> yeah. I saw him more than my new wife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, so, yeah. so you had world series plus IP transition plus getting married. That was a, yeah. uh. That's going to go down as a good year for you, huh, Johnny? <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, let's talk a little bit about the future. Um, you know, we, we, you talked about where you're at and kind of how you got there. Um, we've talked about how the move to IPs kind of made your facility quite a bit more simple. I mean, if you're pulling out five pallets of worth of cable, there's significant infrastructure facility there. You've talked about how your transition to IP and so forth has allowed you to um, kind of adapt to the pace of change of the industry. Um, so let's talk a little bit about about the future. You know, you, Zach, you said something I kind of want to key in on. 
on how a lot of the gear can now do multiple things and it requires a lot less of it. You talk about the SNPs and how they can do multiple things. And you talked about like on the, the tag multiviewer, for example, because it's not just a 2110 multiviewer. We can also do media processing. We can do all the different sources, whether it's SRT or Zixi or all the different kind of remote workflows you have. So we're seeing that happen where individual pieces of gear that used to do one function now does actually a large array of functions. So, you know, if you're looking at the future of your facility, if you're looking at the future of doing SEC sports, at the future of Texas A&M sports, how do you see that penning out over the next 12 months, uh, 36 months and so forth? What's new? What's coming down the pipe? Well, let's see. Uh... That's a good question. I mean, um, you know, uh, upcoming for us is cameras and upgrading that. And so that'll be kind of a last piece that I think is, you know, a primary system that's not 2110. Um, but as part of that, and as part of this whole process, thinking through what is our future uh, standard going to look like? I mean, we're 720 right now, but um, everything we do for ESPN is 720. They've given no guidance. We don't know what they're going to do in the future. I'm just anticipating our next move is going to be 1080p 60 HDR. Um, and so building the infrastructure for that capability, whenever we make that changeover, um, I expect we'll do that in the next couple of years. Um, so that one's kind of a, I guess, a pretty significant change typically, except that it's, not now because uh, the network bandwidth is already there. We might have to scale up a couple extra servers for a replay or for tag or you know whatever it is to handle some extra network capacity. But um, in that instance, you know, in that instance, we're already set for the future. Um, outside of that, we do a lot of virtualization already. Uh, I think virtualization is probably going to be bigger and bigger, whether it's on prem or in a public cloud. Um, you know, I think things like tag being software based, I think we're going to see a lot more of that just because the standard hardware is already there um, to be able to support what we do. And so uh, I think that's where we'll be looking um, for, you know, any future stuff and uh, yeah. So let's, yeah, like you said with the cameras, you know, we're, uh, you know, once those are 2110, that frees up a lot of the gateway that we're using. And so as the um, devices that we're using um, and, and gatewaying right now, as we move those to 2110, then now moving to 1080p HDR, we will need a lot of up down cross. And so then now we don't need the gateway. So now we can make those up down cross and it's always uh, growing with that. So, you know, on that, Johnny, you're, you both have mentioned multiple times about how much how you have this um, this relationship with your finance department and with the the CFO and and obviously with engineering. So it seems like a lot of the decisions you've been making in the past and currently are making kind of kind of has this almost like this one mind between you and finance and like the goals of uh, the Texas A and M um, group to be able to kind of move forward. So t can you tell us a little bit about your day-to-day -day with finance and how the, how this works as a, as a commercial discussion and how you guys work together as teams? Because it really seems like you've had these goals to kind of to get things into IP, to get things into virtualization, to get things into software. Um, but you don't get that unless you kind of work together as one team, especially with the budgets required. So can you tell us a little bit about how that works with uh, the financial side of the industry? I think the business word is synergy, right? <laughs> yes. Uh... But yeah, I mean, right. It's all about having the same goal and knowing the direction and then trusting uh, the people that are in place. And so, you know, a lot of people, a lot of places we go, oh, Texas A&M, you got that oil money. And uh, <laughs> we do our, we are fortunate. We do have, you know, some good resources, but we're also, I think, and this is an insider looking out, but I think we are pretty smart with how we use those resources. The last thing I have is we have a bunch of questions coming in from um, from the from the larger group, and we want to get to them. I have one last question, and Johnny, I'll kind of look at you a little bit more on this one because you definitely have an X factor that I don't think a lot of people appreciate is the fact that you have a lot of students, like literally college students, running. $100,000 cameras, 
couple hundred thousand dollar switchers and also just training them in the environment. So, you know, as you, people always look at 2110 and IP based infrastructures as being incredibly complex, but really you have people that have no broadcast experience walking in and doing production. So it seems like almost even with the migration to IP, the way you've done it, it's almost simplified the workflow enough for students to do it. So can you describe how it works with the students and how all that uh, works out together? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, we, uh, we really have a lot of great, um, great students and, um, you know, whether they um, come in and find out this is something that they want to do in the, in the future, like me, I mean, I started as a student. I mean, I know, uh, you know, we might not be the oldest uh, engineering group out there, uh, but, uh, but I mean, I started as a student um, and found out that this is what I really want to do. Um, and then, you know, we have about 20 to 25 um, student engineers and, you know, a lot, they're coming in. They don't have to be engineering majors. Um, you know, if they're just interested in the technology and they want to learn, then um, we bring them on and uh, we, we teach them everything. And, and I mean, uh, the students nowadays, I mean, the, all this technology is not new to them. Um, so, you know, if I gave them something that was analog, they wouldn't know what to do with it. But, uh, right. you know, if I give them a screen that's got graphics on it, say, Hey, you push this and, and this, and then it'll go, um, you know, uh, they, they pick things up really quick. Um, they help us out in the field, setting up cameras. Um, and, uh, they're really good communicating back to us. And that's kind of what, um, makes us run really. We couldn't do it without them. All right. Yeah, I mean, uh, like you said change to direct trajectory for him. You know, we've had other students who've done the same, you know, whether it's on the broadcast production side, some who have gone on to work for ESPN. Uh, we had a student who now works for Game Creek on one of their IP trucks. And so, you know, it's, it's pretty cool opportunity and one that I wish I had when I was in school. It was, you know, it wasn't there when I was here. So um, yeah, it's, it's a pretty unique uh, way to get some good labor, but also, you know, really impact some lives that uh, otherwise might not have, um, you know, been able to get into the broadcast industry, which we, I think, need is, uh, is a pipeline. Um, I think we are all seeing, like, there is a uh, lack of talent available that I've, uh, that I've been able to find anyways. All right. Think, uh, and that's the part I think it really makes you guys unique too, is having to work in that environment and, and, and that. And by the, by the way, the industry as a whole is very grateful for what you're doing there. So I appreciate that. <laughs> and it, it doesn't come without its struggles because they are no, college yes, students. Yes. Uh, so there <laughs> are some uh, early Sunday morning um, games that uh, they might be struggling a little bit. But yeah, they, they're not they, bringing their uh, A game after a Saturday night. <laughs> right, but, right. Uh, you know, they, they still work hard. And, and the students nowadays, um, you know, they're really innovative and they help us too. Um, you know, we tell them, if you have any ideas, uh, come bring it to us, you know. Um, we're not going to shoot uh, anything down, so they help us out too. So we got quite a few questions to work through from uh, everybody else. I'll just read them to you guys, and let's just dive into them. Um, did you run into any issues with vendor interoperability? If so, how did the vendors take it when you brought the issues to them? Were there any situations where you just had to walk away from a vendor because you just didn't get there? I mean, yeah. Certainly, always. I mean, some vendors are, uh, they play better with others than, um, than other vendors. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, before we go all the way into something, we're going to make sure that there's core functionality that ties together. Um, you know, I don't want to necessarily uh, drag anybody. So, but yeah, I mean, of course, there has been times where, you know, we get far along into the process. We're like, oh, man, this is this is uh, this is the what we want to use. And then we find, OK, well, it's not going to integrate well or it's going to be too much of a headache. Is this something that y'all want to commit to changing? And sometimes vendor will say yes, sometimes no. And if it's no, then, you know, OK, well that's fine for you and we'll cut ties and go the other way. I mean, we, again, we, we're more, we like to be more relationship based in terms of who we're working with. We have to know that we have a good relationship of you understand what we're doing and what we're trying to accomplish. And yeah, we're going to be sometimes a pain, but 
we're all going to get better together. And uh, if that's not the way somebody likes to work, and that's fine, and uh, you know, we'll find somebody else. Um, fair enough. And by the way, vendors who are on this call, listen to this. This is very true. <laughs> Um, another one. Do you have any plans to provide video to consumers or are you always going to be doing like 2110 to ESPN? You know, do you have any kind of like direct to home kind of plans or anything like that? Well, contractually ESPN owns our, uh, broadcast rights. And so at present there is no way for us to broadcast any games other than through ESPN outside of that. Um, we do the Pulse, which is a weekly football, um, kind of a hard knocks type program. Um, and then we do a lot of social media content and other, you know, sponsored content. So we do a lot of stuff on alternate ways, but no, no, we won't be able to do anything live like that. All right. How about, um, how do you synergize the multiple schools that have a set standard to support live production at each venue? For example, um, you know, bandwidth is always a consistent issue and that kind of stuff. So how do you work together with multiple schools when you're doing those productions? Or do you have to? Uh, no, I mean, every school is kind of left to their own choices. And so the only kind of unifying thing is the standards from ESPN in terms of camera count. And we all have to use expression and, mm -hmm. um, things like that but otherwise yeah there's no like interop necessarily between schools yeah most of the communication between schools is through espn so you know when we have away games we will get our team's feed you know from that school um but that's all run through espn yeah um how about testing new technologies you want to try something new like for example um tag you know it's a software-based solution that runs on standard dell servers and i just had a power bump so apologies for <laughs> that everybody we, can... we can still hear you at least yeah as long as you can hear me my everything just flashed great okay um as long as you can still hear me you can keep going Sure. So uh, how do you test the new technologies? You know, is, is there a, like a process, like you take in a vendor, you say, this is what I want it to do, or like on the tag platform where you have a, a software-based platform that can do a bunch of stuff. Um, but, you know, how does, that, how does that process work for you? Yeah, I mean, it always starts with reaching out and asking, hey, this is what we're looking to do. We see that your product, it looks like does this. We would like to evaluate it. And some are on board with sending a demo unit. We're big into, for instance, tag being able to ship out a uh, a virtual instance to us that we could run on prem in our own virtual infrastructure, and that's that was uh, that was kind of a big yeah. selling point for I mean, us. We spun up the uh, demo for tag in like fifteen minutes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to go from hey we want to try this to okay here's the uh, installers and here's a demo key. Uh, go wild and you know obviously like we said we're the idiots that like to take on too much but <laughs> uh to be able to do that and try that um that's huge for us i mean we're we're big into uh doing proof of concepts and working with uh the vendor to to try and see how it'll integrate for our you know within our plant yeah, so let's, you know, there's been a couple of questions about virtualization. Actually, one just came in about virtualization. So since we're talking about it, um, you know, what do you do for your, virtual, your virtualized infrastructure? Does it just support like asset management? Is it actually supporting live production in terms of processing? Like describe your virtualized infrastructure a little bit there. Yeah, so, I mean, similar to how we approached 2110 um, transition, started with one server to do some virtual uh infrastructure services you know whether it's dante domain manager or um you know linux some linux servers that we want to do something with uh it's grown into now we're running two clusters six servers with a san um it does virtual editors so all of our editors can you know edit from their houses if they need to to do you know quick edits and things like that it's not perfect it's not something you want to finish your product on, but it gives them that convenience and that availability to do things wherever they are. Especially when they're traveling with teams they, you know, a game ends, they can go in and quickly edit a quick video for social media from their hotel. Yeah. Uh, so for broadcast, all of our expressions are virtual. And so uh, we do 
NDI to SDI to 2110 um, currently uh, until we can find an NDI to 2110 solution that can you know do the uh, key fill sort of transition. Um, but you know then we also use the output for can't you know for the uh, the preview output into tag because tag can do NDI and so we've just found that nice little synergy as well. So we rely uh, very heavily on on virtualization right now it's running uh, our primary and backup um, cerebrum servers I mean so yeah it is it is running critical infrastructure for and us e even for engineering we we can support shows from home I mean yeah. most of the stuff we can do from home is what we would be doing here and um, especially you know during COVID that was big for us because you know everyone was at home you know if one of us got sick we were home and, and we could still support the show as if we were there you know um, even with comms and uh, you know, getting our engineering multi-views, um, and we can see everything remote. Yeah, yeah, I forgot engineering uh, yeah. engineering VMs, and so yeah. I mean, it it was always evolving for us, and uh, and always looking for all right, what makes sense to virtualize, what makes sense to still be standalone. I think there's still places for things to be standalone. Um, you know, we could have, I guess, acquired a couple more servers and implement you know integrated it into the virtual infrastructure and run tag off that but we felt you know okay it makes more sense to kind of dedicate some hardware to to our multi-views and get the most out of it as we can from each server well let's you know let's take the conversation to the next step i believe uh chip brought in some uh, a question along those lines is you know once you get a, a resource virtualized there's no reason why you can't push it up into the public domain like a public cloud aws or azure and as you know as a vendor we can't have any conversations today without talking about the cloud quotation marks just somebody else's servers right but you know you look at a product like your tag multivere where you know 2110 is great but it's primarily focused for on-prem due to its bandwidth and that kind of stuff but once you start taking in other sources such as like ndi or srt or zixi or wrist you know all of which you get when you buy the the, the tag multi viewer how what's your future what's your vision of that of taking what is a virtualized resource sitting on your servers on your virtual virtualization infrastructure today and pushing it in the cloud or do you not see a home for that in your current workflows like is there a requirement for that you know it's it's the there's the cost calculation i mean with the i think i think public cloud works if you're doing limited time of usage and something that doesn't need to be available more than you know a couple hours i think outside of i think the amount of time that we use stuff and that we have to have things up and running the cost just becomes clearly that it makes more sense to have it on prem it it, it it's both control and cost and bandwidth i mean those are the i guess the three corners of the triangle always for the cloud um I think it'll get to the point where cost will come down and in a lot of instances it'll make sense. I don't think it'll ever make sense always. Um, you know, maybe we are a use case where it will never make sense. I don't know. Um, Cause we don't do a lot of the remote productions, you know, with people across the country or across the state or across the world. Um, all of our stuff is, pretty much well contained within our, you know, within the campus, but, you know, uh, somebody who does do a lot of that hundred percent, I mean, I think, uh, there's already instances of people who have done fully remote or fully, uh, cloud-based productions. I think maybe even ESPN has done something. I think I saw something about the recently about a conference game that they did like, like that. So, for us, you know, it's evaluate as it as it makes sense. Um, maybe once our current hardware life cycle is up, evaluate the cost then and see if it makes sense to re up or or uh, move it to the cloud at that point. But it does seem that you're kind of making decisions that are that allow you to there because you said like the cerebrum, for example, can be run in a virtual in a virtualized environment. We know for a fact that tag can you know run on on-prem servers or on-prem virtualization or even in the cloud on a um, on an instance up there so it seems like you're as you're going through the devices that can be virtualized uh, you're kind of making that that decision now yeah definitely and I mean it all comes back to your risk profile too I mean like for us it's like okay maybe we've got 
through, maybe we have somehow a one gig connection um, to a cloud provider. Well, we've got 100 gig in our facility and so, and we're not reliant on the internet going down and somebody hitting a pole with a backhoe or something like that. So it's, it's kind of way in that, that sort of idea of, all right, we've got the availability, we've got the flexibility, what makes the most sense. By the way, I love how casually you just happen to say that you have a hundred gig diverse connections. I think there's most people on this call would be absolutely, uh, uh, blown away and absolutely happy to be able to have that kind of, uh, that kind of pipe. So that's pretty awesome. You guys have that out there considering where you are in the state of Texas too. Sure. Um, so a couple more questions as we're going through, uh, a couple of these kind of are kind of running together, you know, we talked about the challenges you've encountered transitioning from uh, SDI to 2110. Um, apparently somebody uh, has a concern about, do you have any concern about the 2110 production inflexibility? Have you ever run, run into 2110 has any inflexibility, any issues that, that have created that maybe you didn't have in the, uh, the SDI world? I mean, <clears throat> I think the biggest thing right now, um, that we run into is because everything is in 2110. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we, we, we kind of had to think about it differently. Like, how are we going to get, um, you know, audio to and from and, and, uh, specifically for our transmission with ESPN, you know, we do a lot of breakaway audio. So, you know, each channel, um, is going to be a different audio feed, but how do we do that? And how do we split up an eight channel or a two channel, um, 2110 stream. So I think that was kind of the biggest uh, learning curve for us and, you know, maybe a limitation where we kind of had to rethink how we do things. Yeah, that's that's right. Like audio has probably been one of the, the yeah. hardest. I mean, because you, you know, previously we had a audio router that, you know, does all the embed, de-embed between the SDI router. And so audio shuffling so much easier um, on the baseband world right now. Uh, we've gotten to a point where we're good with our, our audio workflow, but certainly that was uh, not the easiest. And then, yeah, the last, you know, what do they say, the last uh, 60 feet or whatever to your endpoint, whether it's a talent monitor at the court side or, you know, the monitor walls in our existing facility that already had all of the uh, SDI infrastructure in place. And so as you have to add new stuff, it's like, okay, do we run fiber and do conversions on the back of the monitor that way? Or do we keep it a central sort of gateway? So, you know, it hasn't been anything that's like showstopper or anything that makes us regret the decisions. Um, but it's like all things, it's like, what's your appetite for overcoming some of those aspects? And, you know, this, the project this summer was, uh, I think a bit bigger than the whole, the, the sum of it was a bit bigger than maybe we thought of it as its individual parts. And, uh, maybe had we known going in what everything was going to take this summer, then maybe we would have done something different. Uh, so that's <laughs> some ignorance coming. <laughs> yeah. And I think that, I mean, the hardest thing was just kind of changing our mindset on how thing, you know, how things work and how our, our workflow is, um, you know, from the analog baseband way to now the 2110. And now that we, I think we've kind of grasped that whole idea. And so, you know, it was definitely a learning curve, but, you know, once you kind of grasp that idea and, and um, how your workflow changes, then uh, we were able to, you know, get everything how we want it. Yeah, I mean, things like um, an ISO for talent, yeah. you know, okay, that has to be a separate feed. Well, we have to think, you have to think about it different. Now you're just controlling the endpoint and the producer has to just be able to control the endpoint of whatever that, you know, gateway is. And so, it's just a whole different mind shift of, uh, of how, how you have to think through each aspect, I guess. So we have just enough time for probably one more question. And by the way, there's a lot of other questions on there in terms about how, you know, how do we do, um, 
you know, QoV monitoring, uh, the multi-viewer, you just use that for visual monitoring and things like that. Uh, for everybody who does ask questions we didn't address, we will get back to you. Uh, we'll, th we'll put it up there in chat. So sorry we just didn't have quite enough time on all of them. Um, but to kind of close it out, if you had one th lesson, and I'll ask this for both, so I need two answers and one from each one of you guys, if that's cool. If through this whole process, if there was one set of wisdom that you could give everybody of, this is something that we did that we thought was fantastic, or this is something that we did that was just an absolute dumpster fire, um, what would it be? You know, what, what, what would you give everybody else in terms of that migration you made to get to where you're at today? I'm not to put you on the spot. First, while I have to think hard. <laughs> By the way, if yeah. anybody want, if uh, anybody wonders if we didn't do this, uh, if we can this whole thing, obviously we did not. Most of these questions no, were yeah. doing on the fly, so <laughs> we'll give them a second uh, to think. Yeah, I mean, I think the um, biggest thing is you know not um, being stuck in the mindset of how we used to do things. I mean, uh, I think for me, kind of, you know, I didn't know as much of. Um, you know, how, how things used to be when I, when I first came in. Um, but that's still how I learned things. And so, yeah, I think a lot of people, you know, they've been doing the same, um, uh, the same thing, the same way for, you know, so long and, and everyone knows that it works like, you know, why take the risk? Um, and so it was kind of that, um, that, you know, switch in, in of our mindset of, okay, now we can do all of these things that we couldn't do before. Um, and so just being committed to that and, um, you know, committed to, yeah, it's, you know, it might be more work, but if we take the time, if we really take the time to do something and especially with a lot of the customization of everything that we can do now, then we can, you know, make something that's, that's really awesome that we never had before. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, even being, uh, I guess forefront or whatever forward thinking as we are like I still you know I still know like the solid reliability of this coax cable and I know what's gonna break and if it's broken how to fix it and all of these things and and there's just a, something simple and reassuring about all right one video cable one signal one you know and so even we sat, we were sitting in the control room, our first football game. And I was like, Oh my God, it's actually all working. You know, like all of these signals are flowing through a network switch and in real time and it's all actually working. So I don't know. It's we've, we've had a lot of our own um, failures, but we're yeah, usually and, pretty good about covering them. Up. <laughs> and I don't know. <laughs> I think the word is we're pretty good about engineering around our own failures yeah. and making sure that it doesn't impact the uh, end user. Yeah, and I don't think because you know we had the slow transition, um, and so I, I don't think you know we had you know anything that was completely catastrophic. But there were uh, so many of those times where we are you know putting something in and then we're like, oh wait, how are we gonna like how are we gonna do this, you know, how yeah. are we going to get our uh, analog audio to our rollers? We didn't and, even and think the, about yeah. that. <laughs> like, so that was one of those things where, you know, you think you thought about everything and then you're like, oh, wait, how do I get this thing here now? Yeah. What about this one caveat thing that yeah. you never think about because it's always worked and you're like, oh, that was tied into this. Yeah. It was tied into this and that. So, you know, I think if at all possible, you know, you have to like, you have to take, you have to start small. I mean, uh, when, whenever possible, I mean, a new build is different, obviously, than somebody who's transitioning and, you know, some, maybe somebody doesn't want to do a five year transition, but it allows you that extra room to make mistakes because, you know, if you have something that's working and you're replacing it with something that's an upgrade, well, at the end of the day, you can always fall back. Right. And so. Mm -hmm. Whenever we're doing something new, we always know, okay, at the end of the day, if we have to make it work, we'll make it work this way and yeah. it won't be what we wanted it to be, but it's going to work. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, thank you for sharing your insight. I know there's a lot of stuff you've been through that uh, a lot of people want to hear about, and it's always great to let other people make your mistakes for you. And then you can just tell everybody else, don't do it like this, or more importantly, 
you do the research on who you believe is to be the best vendor or the best solution, and you can share that with everybody else. So we really appreciate you taking the time to uh, to come up here and kind of share that knowledge. Uh, we did film, I think, today and off and on some uh, some stand-ups with you, some, some kind of uh, B-roll of your facility and things like that that we will be posting uh, to the TAG uh, VS website. So for anybody else on the call, if you'd like to see more behind the scenes um, of their facility, you want to see how, how it works, how it looks, and also just see some more footage with uh, Johnny and Zach talking about their facility and uh, some stuff that we weren't able to just fit into the one hour today, um, please feel free to visit the website. I don't think it'll be posted immediately, but you will see it here very shortly. Um, but mainly, gentlemen, we just want to thank you and thank you everybody who attended this today. Um, I know there was a lot of questions that we answered. Uh, but I know there was equally amounts that we weren't quite able to get to. So we will chase those questions down and uh, we'll get back to you. And again, thank you for all of your time today. And I hope everybody else has a fantastic week. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks.